Okay, so today we'll be talking about the mechanism of action of commonly misused antibiotics in Nigeria and just explaining how antibiotics work. So for introduction, um, when you talk about microorganisms or microbes, you're referring to organisms that are so tiny that you can't see them with a the naked eye. And so you need a microscope to, able to, to be able to see these um, tiny microorganisms. And examples of microorganisms, you have bacteria, um, fungi, protozoa, and viruses. And um, you could classify microbes as either good or bad. So for good microbes, they're very, um, very helpful microbes that it can help us like digesting food in our stomach or like helping plants to grow by providing the necessary nutrients. Or um, they also have decomposing waste. For example, there are some bacteria that can eat up like crude oil or it spills into the environment. And we also need um, microbes in making food products such as bread, yogurt, wine, cheese. So we, I think it's something about microorganisms to think, oh, these are bad, but actually there are a lot more uh, microorganisms that are, are beneficial than the ones that actually cause harm. And speaking of harm, um, bad microbes um, can cause, um, we have the ones that cause food spoilage. So like, if, for example, you leave like food and uh, maybe like bread and after a while you see it goes bad, like mold forms on the bread. So that's an example of one of, um, um, one of the things that bad, bad microbes can do. And um, today, which is what we we'll be talking about mostly, is about um, bad microbes can also cause infections. And how are infections treated? This is done using antimicrobials. So what are antimicrobials? Antimicrobials are substances that can either, they are designed to either kill a microorganism or they inhibit the good. By this, we mean that they stop them from growing. And examples of antimicrobials, um, you might have come across these names before. We have antibiotics, um, which work against bacteria. Then we have antifungals, which work against fungi. We have antiprotozoa, protozoans, and we have antivirals against viruses. Now, for the focus of um, today's presentation, we'll be looking at bacteria and antibiotics. So how do antibiotics work? Like we hear people talk about time, like, oh, they kill bacteria, you know, have infections, you know, you need antibiotics to, you know, help treat that infection. But how exactly do these antibiotics work? So antibiotics can either kill bacteria or stop them from growing, from multiplying through various means. The first is that they can inhibit the cell wall synthesis. So think about like the cell wall as maybe like the skin, the outer layer of the bacteria. So um, how antibiotics can actually prevent bacteria from making their in quote outer skin and by doing that they prevent either they stop them from growing another way is um by inhibiting protein synthesis so proteins, as we know um from like basic science and in, in like primary and secondary schools proteins are like the building blocks of the body right so if bacteria aren't able to produce their own building blocks their own proteins at least can actually slow their growth or also kill them in some cases and then um, you could also, um, antibiotics can also act by inhibiting nucleic acid synthesis and metabolism. So um, nucleic acid is like DNA, my head of DNA and RNA. What it simply means is like the information, like DNA or RNA, they contain like your genetic information, information about you that is needed to produce more cells so that you keep growing, keep multiplying. So what happens is that antibiotics can actually go and prevent bacteria from making new DNA copies or new genetic information. And this also like stops their growth or kills them in some cases. And then another way that antibiotics can work is by disrupting the structure of their bacterial membrane. So if we think about the membranes as like the, for example, our skin, if, imagine if you had like large holes like punctured all over your skin, you would probably just start losing blood and that could you know, eventually lead to death. So, so some antibiotics go and just like punch like the, the outer layer, the membrane of the bacteria. And because of that, the bacteria lose vital ions and um, they, they, um, which eventually leads to death. So these are some of the ways that antibiotics actually work um, to kill bacteria. And just to make it like a visual representation. So we have different classes of antibiotics and these different classes of antibiotics are designed to target different areas. So we've talked about like the DNA, the proteins, the membranes, the cell walls. And we actually have, um, um, so, so looking at the diagram here, like we can see like the cell wall. Um, so the antibiotics, examples of antibiotics that target, for example, like the cell wall of the bacteria, the outer layer. Oops, sorry. Um, 
We have, um, for example, penicillin, which is, uh, I think, one of the more familiar um, antibiotics. And we have anti uh, ampiclox, rather. And for the um, names that are highlighted in red, I will be talking further just about a little bit more about like how they work and like just the kind of cases they're used to treat. And then um, for examples of antibiotics that target like the, the DNA or RNA, that's like targeting cells, um, the genetic information, produ production of genetic information that the bacteria need to keep growing. Examples include flagell, which we'll talk about, um, superfloxacin. And we also have um, antibiotics that target the synthesis of folate. Now, folate is a compound that is important for um, producing DNA and also some proteins for some bacteria. And so an example of an antibiotic that targets this particular part, um, part of, the back, of the bacteria um, and metabolism or the bacteria of growth, the bacterial life, is called septrine. Um, and then lastly, we also have antibiotics that can damage the cell membrane. And finally, we have antibiotics that can also target like protein synthesis. That is, they prevent, um, they, they stop or they prevent the bacteria from making new proteins, like making new building blocks. And examples include tetracycline and gentamicin. So like I said earlier, we'll be speaking more um, on the antibiotics that have been highlighted in red. So let's talk about some commonly misused antibiotics in Nigeria. So the first is flagell. So flagell um, also is called uh, metronidazole. And it's something to know about flagell is that it's bacteriostatic. What this means is that how it affects bacteria is that it stops the bacteria from growing. And then how does it work? In the previous slide, we talked about the different points that antibiotics can act on. So in the case of flagell, it works by inhibiting DNA synthesis. So when it stops, it stops the bacteria from replicating, from like multiplying, dividing. When it stops that process, then it's able to stop the bacteria from growing. So this is the point. And I mean, clinically, flagell has been prescribed for a range of um, um, con conditions such as like abscesses, like you know when you have like maybe. Um, bacteria forming like pores maybe in your organs let's say the stoma maybe the reproductive tract or you also have and um, they've also been prescribed for like ulcers for endocarditis which doctor um which mrs juliet by the most was speaking about in her presentation um for colon infection that's caused by a bacteria known as clostridium difficile and also for bacterial vaginosis which is a bacterial vagina this is just one some of the um, cases of uh, flagellism prescribed. So you can see that this, this um, condition is actually caused across different parts of the body. So this antibiotic, um, they're actually very useful. And most times, they, some, some of the antibiotics actually work against different bacteria, which is an issue, right, if resistance starts to come up, and which is what we're going to talk about that in subsequent slides. Because if we, resistance comes up, then we're not just thinking about, oh, we've lost this drug for this particular disease. But it's more likely like, you're losing an antibiotic that actually helps in managing a wide range of diseases. And which is why we all need to act, do our part to stop um, antibiotic resistance. And so um, a common misuse scenario in Nigeria, so when, it, when this means like misuse of um, flagell, would be for like stomach upset. Think about it, like growing up in Nigeria, I know like before I knew better, thanks to um, awareness about antimicrobial resistance, it's it's common to like when somebody has a stomach, oh, I don't feel well, my tummy hurts, like, oh, go and buy flagell, go to the pharmacist or go to the chemist and buy flagell over, over the counter. So that's a common misuse scenario in Nigeria. Actually, before, um, usually for you to be for, to actually take antibiotics, it has to be actually be prescribed by a qualified healthcare professional and not just like, oh, I don't feel well, I would just take flagell. Oh, I'm going for this party. I don't want my tummy to disturb me. Oh, let me go and buy flagell before I go for the party. So I think it's just, we're all just trying to be very aware of the different situations that can, um, maybe different situations that come up. For example, stomach upset, where we might tend to go and misuse antibiotics. So it's always important to rely, um, to follow the doc um, doctor's prescription and not just buy antibiotics over the counter. Another um, antibiotic which is commonly um, misused in Nigeria is tetracycline. Now, tetracycline is a broad spectrum antibiotic. What does this mean? It means that it affects a wide range of bacteria. 
So that means it has use in managing a wide range of infections. And how does tetracycline work? It stops bacteria from growing. And how does it do this? By inhibiting protein synthesis. So like we said earlier, proteins, think about proteins as like building blocks of bacteria. So by stopping the bacteria from making more building blocks, they can't grow any further. And this limits um, um, their spread and their like growth. So that's how tetracycline works. And it's used for a wide, it's prescribed for a wide range of conditions, examples like acne, chlamydia infection, urinary infections. But of course, this has to be under the guidance of like a qualified healthcare professional. And, and there are also special use cases for tetracycline. So for example, some patients might be allergic. So as we're all different, we're like over like 7 billion people in the world. So our bodies are different and we react to drugs differently. And one of the uses of um, tetracycline is that some people are maybe allergic to a kind of antibiotic, for instance, penicillin. So you can't give them penicillin if they have an infection. So they have to use something else. One of the antibiotics that's commonly used in those cases is tetracycline, which further you know, um, underscores the importance of each, each one of us playing our part to reduce the spread of resistance, bacterial resistance to these antibiotics. Another special use case is in treating um, plague. And so common misuse scenario, just like flagell, is in stomach upset. And I know one example, like when people are traveling, I know then growing up, like if someone was traveling, maybe taking a long trip, you just say, oh, I'll just take tetracycline you know, to calm my stomach while, while I'm on the bus or while I'm on the plane. I don't want to have to use the toilet. So I'll just take, you know, just pop these two pills and then go on my way. But when we, when we all take antibiotics without the doctor's prescription, we are, further, um, we are also contributing to the spread of, you know, antibacterial resistance. So it's just another reminder before you take an before you buy an antibiotic or before you take an antibiotic, it has to be under the guidance of a qualified healthcare professional. The third antibiotic um, that we'll talk about, which is commonly misused, is septrine. And think about it like when you had maybe think about if you had if you had a cold, let's say you had a cold or cough or catar, it's most likely that someone would have said, Oh, just take septrine for that, you know, just take it two tablets or whatever, and tomorrow you'll be fine. And actually, septin is an antibiotic. And so it should be taken, it shouldn't just be taken like, you know, just, I don't feel well, or I think, I think tomorrow my nose will be blocked. Let me take septin now to stop it, no. Um, we should actually just stick to taking antibiotics, you know, for their actual, like, the under the guidance of the doctor or the healthcare professional and for the actual, like, condition. So, um, for example, a septrin in this case is made is a combination of two different antibiotics, um, oxazole and trimetoprim. And in sometimes you can have like combinations of two different drugs just to make it more effective and to kill like a wider range of bacteria because they target different points or different aspects. Then they are able to give greater protection. And so, for example, in this case, septrin works by inhibiting folate. Synthesis. Now, folate is a key compound that is required for DNA synthesis. And DNA, like we explained earlier, is the genetic information that bacteria and even everyone uses to keep reproducing or replicating themselves. So it's the reason why we're able to grow, like from one of the reasons, anyways, um, it consists of genetic information. So when this septrine like attacks or prevents bacteria from making folates. If they don't make folates, they can't make DNA. If they can't make DNA, they can't multiply. So this is a way that it uses septrin works to um, stop or like inhibit bacteria um, production as an antibiotic. And it has been prescribed for various, um, various conditions, including um, urinary tract infection and traveler's diarrhea. And, no, and also there are special use cases for septrin. So for example, some people who maybe have like underlying conditions or other like chronic clinical conditions, um, other conditions where like their immune system is not so strong compared to like the general population. So for example, maybe people with cancer, living with cancer, people who are living with HIV AIDS, who have like a less than optimal immune system, septrin is often used in, in, in those individuals to prevent them from falling like falling ill or like um, having further infection so this is actually like very important like application for septrin and so if we're if we keep we have situations where like the bacteria become resistant to septrin it will particularly affect people who 
naturally have even a lower or a weakened immune system compared to the rest of us. And um, a common misuse in Nigeria, like I said earlier, is for, for a common cold, just popping, oh, I'll just take septrin because I don't feel well, or you know, I just want this cata to clear or have a presentation tomorrow and I want to be my best. So this is one of the one of the ways that septrin has been misused in Nigeria. And the final one today is Ampiclox that we'll be talking about. Now, Ampiclox, um, like septrin, is a combination of two antibiotics. We have ampicillin and we have cloxacillin. And like I explained earlier, sometimes you need to combine, you know, two different antibiotics just to give like a higher strength or like higher potency and to attack maybe a wide range of bacteria. And for ampiclox, it's broad spectrum. So it affects a wide range of bacteria, like I just mentioned. And how does it work? It works by inhibiting the cell wall synthesis. So if you think about the cell wall as like the outer layer of your skin, if you're not able to, for example, if you're if you're not able to like if bacteria can't like produce um the the compounds that are needed as part of their cell wall, like this um, like what Ampiflux does, then it leads um stops their growth, eventually leads to death because they can't replicate, they can't divide themselves because of the action of Ampiflux. And so um it's been used for like treatment for urinary, one of some of the cases that's been used for the like, Ampiflux is used for. It's like urinary treatment for urinary and respiratory, respiratory tract infection, and also endocarditis, which Mrs. Bademosi would talk about in her um, in her talk coming up after mine. And then also um, a common misuse scenario I've experienced this one is um, for boils. So um, sometimes maybe if you have like a boil, like a swelling, like with maybe pores in your on your skin, your arms, your legs, wherever. And someone just says, oh, you have boil. Go and take Ampiflux, you know, go, go to the chemist, buy 15 naira Ampiflux, you'll be fine. As we've talked about, like, I mean, in previous series and also today as well, like, we should all only use antibiotics under the prescription of like a qualified healthcare professional, so like your doctor, um, for example. So um, we all have our parts to play in like reducing the the the, the rise of, bacterial resistance to antibiotics. And I know I've been talking about resistance, you know, resistance. So that's what we're going to be talking about. What exactly does it mean that a bacteria is resistant to an antibiotic? So antimicrobial, so yeah, just like what we said earlier, in summary, in, when we improper or indiscriminate use of antibiotics can lead to antibiotic um, slash antimicrobial resistance. And what is anti antimicrobial resistance? Now we think about it like um, bacteria, they continually change to adapt to their living environment. And it's not just about, it's not only for bacteria, but all microorganisms actually do this. And it's natural and it's part of evolution. Even as human beings, for example, if you're going to walk, and you notice that there's like a puddle, like, you know, water or mud somewhere, you won't just walk through the mud, you go around it, right? That's your way of adapting to that situation. So it's just a natural thing that we do. And so what happens is that um, when, anti when, we, when we keep like, um, when, when we have antibiotics, it puts like pressure on the bacteria. It's called selective pressure. So like, it's just like an obstacle, right, um, for the bacteria. And in some cases, you can have some of the bacteria, they can adapt and then they become insensitive to the antibiotic. Just like how if you see a puddle here, like muddy water and you're on your way to work, or like, for example, if you're walking on the street and then you see muddy water and then you know a bus is coming, you know that once the bus passes that place, the water will splash on you. So before the bus comes to you, you quickly just find another route to follow, right? That is your way of adapting. So that's a way, like an, like an explanation of how bacteria can adapt to antibiotics. And over time, they become insensitive to them. So like, for example, when you see the car coming, because you're far from the puddle, you're not concerned about the water splashing on you anymore because you know you're so far from the bus. So it's ex an example of how like bacteria can now eventually become insensitive to the antibiotics. So no matter how much you put, it's like mm, this, no shaking, like I'm here, like I'm not going to die, that kind of thing. So when bacteria change in a way that causes antibiotics to, to become ineffective against them, so note that it's the bacteria that is changing, right? If you're walking on the road, it's you that is changing your direction. It's not the bus. The bus is still coming the way it is. The muddy water is still there, but you decided to change your direction. In that same way, when bacteria change in a way that causes antibiotics to become ineffective, this is what we call antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance. And those changed bacteria are just simply called superbugs. 
So like a visual representation of what we just talked about. So what happens when we don't use antibiotics the right way? Like when we keep maybe pumping or taking antibiotics without doctor's prescription or like not using the right dose or using somebody else's antibiotics. So like here we see like we have bacteria present in an environment and as they are, bacteria rapidly multiply. So they eventually produce multiple like copies of themselves. And over time, like we said, because it's part of life and it's natural, like the bacteria tend to like, and especially the more they maybe experience antibiotics as well, they tend to like adapt to their environment and then they become um, insensitive. So imagine here, like in this third um, column, we have like the resistant bacteria, right? So if you know, and the other ones around them are not resistant, which means that if they see antibiotics, they are, they are going to die or they'll stop growing. So when you introduce an antibiotic here now, all the other yellow ones around, they will just die, like they will just go. But the ones that have already adapted, the ones that are resistant, they will still stay there because now the antibiotic, like they, they, they've changed, or so the antibiotic is no longer um, effective against them. Like they are not bothered by the antibiotic. So over time now, those resistant bacteria, they now keep growing, right? Because nothing can stop them. The, the antibiotic is not effective against them because they have changed. So over time, they keep growing and multiplying. And so what are the things that can increase or um, the risk of antimicrobial resistance? So examples are these concerns like the healthcare professionals, the doctors, pharmacists, the nurses, nurse practitioners, and the like. So improper prescribing of antibiotics. Now, for we, like those of us who are like just lay people, we're not like, you know, healthcare um, professionals, things that can increase the risk of like antimicrobial resistance. For example, when we go and buy antibiotics over the counter, we did not do tests. We did not have prescription from pharmacist or doctor. We just went to go and buy antibiotics. So like, oh, I want to travel tomorrow. I want my stomach to be steady. Let me go and buy septrin. Or let me go and buy tetracycline. Oh, my stomach is doing me somehow. I ate. Indomie, I ate egg yesterday night. I don't want anything to disturb me. I'm, I'm going somewhere today. Oh, let me go and buy flagyl. Or like you say, ah, I have kata and kofu. Let me go and buy cetrine. So all those things that we go and do, let me just go to chemist. Oh, this boil is disturbing me. Mm, let me buy ampiclox. I beg, I don't want this boil to, to, it's paining me. Please let me go and buy an, an ampiclox. So all those things like buying antibiotics over the counter without tests or like without prescription, that actually increases the risk of uh, antimicrobial resistance because like the more that we take these antibiotics when we don't actually need them, right? The more these bacteria keep seeing them and then before you know it, they just adapt and like next time, you, maybe next time they see the antibiotics, it's not effective anymore against them because the bacteria have what changed. It's just like, for example, if you see somebody like that always disturbs, let's say like you're going to work and you always follow like one street, and you know, there's somebody there that's always begging you for money, always begging, or maybe always disturbing you. After a while, you just find another street and just start going. So it's the same thing, like the more like the bacteria keeps seeing the antibiotics, they'll just find another way or another route to just maneuver then. Next thing, the antibiotics are no longer effective against them. Another way that could increase the risk of um, antimicrobial resistance is, let's say you are sick, you go to the hospital, they give you your, they do the test, they give you your drug, they don't say, okay, take these tablets one time, one tablet three times a day um, for five days. By day three, you are fine. Like, ah, I'm healed. I'm fine. Please, I don't want to be taken. I don't like tablets. I don't like uh, medicine. This one down, one down. All those things, actually, because you think you're fine, but if you don't complete the dose, then it actually can also contribute to antimicrobial resistance because you don't know if you have residual bacteria that have still not, like, you know, died off and everything. So just making sure that we complete, like we always follow the doctor's prescription, complete the dose of the antibiotics or the drugs that you have been given. Another one could be sharing antibiotics. Antibiotics are supposed to be taken, like, you know, prescribed by the doctor or the healthcare professional for you. And so it's, it was prescribed for you, not for your brother, not for your father, not for your mother. So we always, it's always important that we, we don't share antibiotics, right? Because whatever, um, Mr. A had doesn't mean that simply that's disturbing Mr. B. If he has not done a test and it hasn't gone to the doctor, so so why then are we like it's we we should try not to share antibiotics. Like it's just like everybody should should um go their own way of going to the doctor and doing tests before the doctor then determines like what exactly is wrong and what drugs or what antibiotics that they need. And also using leftover antibiotics. So you say ah. When I had this infection then in, in January, the doctor gave me this tablet. I still have this one remaining. And now that this thing has come back again, let me just take it. Is it not the same thing that the doctor, it's not the same thing he's going to tell me 
actually no so um like we said antibiotics are prescribed for like a particular condition for a particular person and for a, and a particular time right so it's important that if let's say you had like a repeat incident instead of just going straight to take the antibiotics it's actually helpful to visit the healthcare professional and then you know find out what is wrong and take um, and let them diagnose and let them prescribe instead of going to take these and take leftover antibiotics and also another thing is like when we use antibiotics for viral infection. So like we explained earlier in one of the slides, antibiotics work against bacteria. Well, antivirals work against vi and viruses. So if you take antibiotics against vi viral infection, it's like you're trying to put like a square peg in a round hole, like it won't fit. So, for, so looking at this, so antibiotics do not work for viral infection, maybe like cold or flu. Because like we explained the structure, um, the way antibiotics work, right? Some of them can target your cell wall. And so the way antibiotics are designed is so that they can target one part. Maybe they target your cell, the, the bacteria cell wall, or they target the bacteria um, protein, you know, target the bacteria DNA. And that structure of the bacteria, which we have on the left, is actually very different from the structure of the virus. So for example, if we had like antibiotics like penicillin that is going to maybe target like the, the cell wall, it wants to stop cell wall synthesis. If it comes to the bacteria, this is where it's going to act, right? Because this is the cell wall. But if it comes to the virus, there is no like, like cell wall, like similar to the bacteria per se. So it, it cannot, there's no place for it to bind to and start attacking. So like if you're taking an antibiotic because of a viral infection like cold or flu, like it doesn't work because there's just no place for the antibiotic to work because the structure is different. So that means you're just taking, like you think, oh, you know, I took antibiotics and I'm fine. It's probably like your body just resolved the infection, but because like the antibiotic itself is not designed to work against viruses because the two structures are completely different. And so um, some of the ways that antibiotic, uh, bacteria rather can, you know, adapt to antibiotics, that they can become resistant is they have their, a different way so for example the first one which is like the diagrams here on the left and we can see that they're like for diff they are different methods and then there are bacteria that have developed like resistance to different classes of antibiotics so one way is that they can limit drug up uptake so like you know like if when the antibiotic is in your system and then it's about to be taken up into the bacteria to then go on either stop their DNA synthesis or like stop their protein synthesis, the bacteria can actually like, maybe for example, they can make their, their cell wall harder or thicker so that the drug cannot pass. And once the drug cannot pass, they cannot die. So those are some of the ways that they become like, they adapt, so to say, and become resistant. Another way, for example, is that they can modify the drug target. What does it mean? Let's say that the drug, maybe in the, in the bacteria, it goes to act, for example, in a particular protein, and a particular location, the bacteria can now go and maybe modify, it can now change the way the protein is so that when the drug comes, the drug cannot bind again. And if the drug cannot bind again, the drug cannot act. And that's it, like the, the antibiotic will not be effective against that bacteria because it has changed um, its structure. Another way is that the bacteria can actually inactivate the drug. So some bacteria, they can produce like um, enzymes to so some molecules that can actually when the drug comes into their system, they'll just break down the drug. Like once they, they'll like, they actually you're chopping something into two or into multiple pieces. So they can degrade the antibiotic. And if, when they now degrade the antibiotic, the antibiotic cannot work because it cannot bind to where it was supposed to bind. And since it can't bind it, it's, it cannot kill the bacteria. So it's, it's, it's interesting like how like over, you know, over time, like bacteria, like they just find different ways to sharp prevent them from falling, like being susceptible to like antibiotics. Um, another a fourth way could be um, is that um, the bacteria can um, use efflux. What does it mean? When efflux is just like pumping out the drug. So the drug goes into the bacteria. They just use um, methods to like pump it out. So you think that, oh, I'm taking antibiotics. You know, it should work against the bacteria. Meanwhile, as the bacteria is coming, as the drug is coming in, the bacteria are pumping, pumping the drugs out. And, then, and the final way that bacteria can be resistant to antibiotics is through um, um, immunity or bypass. So for example, like I gave the example of like um, when if you're going on the road and you see there's like a puddle of water and the car is coming, you quickly like change your direction, right? So that when the car passes, it will not splash water on you. The same way like by some bacteria, because they know that the drug is attacking this 
particular place. They now try and they will not change the way they like um they, they they will not change like maybe their reaction or the way they, they, they function so that they no longer need to go that way. So instead of going that way where they're going to jump the bus, like in my case if I was walking instead of walking that way where like the bus will start with me, the bacteria or like me will now find another way around so that they are not affected by the drug anymore. And it's actually quite smart, but that's how like you know over time like bacteria um actually um, develop resistance to this antibiotic. And which is why we all have to play our part to, to try and slow down the rate at which bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics. And so why is antimicrobial resistance, um, why is it important? So um, first is that resistance has been reported for all classes of antibiotics. So like all the different classes that we have, we actually have cases that bacteria have, been resist have become resistant to, um, to drugs in those classes. And then multi, drug resistant infections are on the rise worldwide. So what does multi-drug resistance um, mean? These infections, they are caused by bacteria that they are not susceptible to multiple classes of antibiotics. And so they are called superbugs. What does this mean in late terms? Like it means that if I bring, they have a bacteria, this kind of bacteria, you can bring, for example, like penicillin is in class A, it won't work. Um, tetracycline is in class B, it won't work. Ceftri uh, um, is in class C, it won't work. So different classes of antibiotics if you target the cell wall, it doesn't work. If you target the protein, it doesn't work. If you target the DNA, it doesn't work. So that's what you call multi-drug resistant in, um, infection or bacteria. Like the diff, like the bacteria, you try different classes, different types of antibiotics, they're already resistant to them. And so, for example, like in 2017, according to the World Health Organization, 558,000 new cases, about estimated number, of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis were detected. It means that when they tried multiple drugs against that particular tuberculosis, like the bacteria will be actually resistant to those drugs, which is actually a problem, right? Because that, that means if we keep if it keeps rising on that scale, it means that over time that we are going to have cases where like the drugs available won't be able to treat the infections. And just speaking about that, yeah, it means in time, like you have increased number of infections, and then it means that there will be fewer treatment options available because the bacteria have become resistant. And where that happens, it's, all, it's not just about like the person and, and the health, right? There are also other implications. So it's going to mean that you have to stay in hospital longer to be able to treat an infection. It also means that it will, it will be higher medical costs, right? The longer you stay and the more drugs you need to try and different tests and all of that. And also, it also increases the rate of death. And finally, it's also antimicrobial resistance is important because like there's been a drop, a reduction in development of new antimicrobials. So it means that the, the antimicrobials we have right now, bacteria are becoming resistant to them. But it's not even like they are producing like newer ones quickly as a backup, right? So that's why we need the current ones that we have, the antibiotics that we have, we need to like treat them well or like um, you don't misuse them so that they can actually last longer, like we'll have less or reduced rise in bacterial resistance. And so what can you and I do? We've talked about like anti, um, microorganisms, antimicrobials, how antibiotics work, you know, the commonly misused antibiotics in um, Nigeria. And then we've also talked about like, what is antimicrobial resistance? And like, how does it really affect us? And you know, like in, um, in how does it affect us? And so finally, like, what are the things that you and I can do so that we can actually play our own part in reducing the spread of antimicrobial resistance. And the first is that we should only take antibiotics when prescribed by a qualified healthcare professional. We should follow prescribed medical advice when taking antibiotics. So follow the right dose, the right timing and spacing, the right duration. And then we should also, um, we can also do our own part in preventing infection. So like regular hand washing, practicing safer sex and then taking vaccinations you know, when necessary. Um, another way is by practicing hygienic food preparation. So being clean in when we are preparing our meals. And um, like we mentioned earlier, don't share your antibiotics and don't, we should also try not to use um, leftover antibiotics. So that's it. Um, I mean, we all have our own part to play. It's not just for one person or for this person, like everyone has a part to play. And I just thank you everyone for listening to the presentation and um, happy to answer any questions during the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Zulumba. That was very, very, very interesting. Lots to digest there. And I think even after this 
live session. I think people need to go back on YouTube and rewatch again. Thank you so much. Um, if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we will take the questions after the second speaker. So just pop them in the chat for us. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to go straight to the second speaker. She is a clinical cardiac scientist with over five years experience working in Nigeria and the United Kingdom. She specializes in adult transthoracic echocardiography and other associated cardiac diagnostic modalities. She, has a, she got her first degree in physiology from the University of Lagos in Nigeria and her master's degree in public health and clinical physiology from the University of Bedfordshire in the, in the UK. She is passionate about cardiac health and empowering the next generation of physiologists to achieve a successful career. And her name is Juliet uh, Badamossi. Over to you, Juliet. Thank you so much, um, Sora. And um, Dr. Zumba, that was an amazing presentation. I learned so much and I'm glad you came before me because now <laughs> at least people have an idea of um, what I'm talking about. So it can be too much of a information overload. Okay, so I will be talking about infected endocarditis and antimicrobial resistance. And it's a very tricky or a very interesting topic because it's not something that's um, very talked about, especially among non-clinical, um, non-healthcare professionals. Okay, so I'll first of all, just start with this question. Which organ of the body do you think cannot be infected? Um, does anyone have any idea or any you can you can unmute if you if you want to see any is there any organ of the body that you think cannot be infected at all? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um so well, nobody's saying anything. So I I, I I would assume that we feel like Every, every organ in the body can be infected. So we all know that we have UTIs, we have lung infection, we have even infection of the blood. Everyone knows all those basic types of infection, but infection of the heart is something that's not very talked about, and that's what I'm talking about today. But before we start, I'll just give you an idea of the subtopics. I'll be talking about the heart structure. Um, I'll be talking about infective endocarditis, what it is, how can you get it? What are the signs and symptoms? How is it diagnosed? What are the treatments and repercussions of antimicrobial resistance and the outcome? First of all, I'll just give us a very brief um, cardiac anatomy and physiology. So when I talk about certain parts of the heart, um, you understand what I'm talking about. I'd like to start off with saying that the heart is like a house. Okay? It has different rooms, which I call chambers. Doors, the valves. Okay, the valves open and close, allow blood in from one chamber to another. So they open up to let blood flow from one chamber into another, and then they close up so that the blood doesn't come back into the previous chamber. So this is a video here. I'll just play this. So this is an echo echocardiogram image just showing you the four chambers of the heart. Okay, this is the left ventricle, this is the left atrium right ventricle and this is the right atrium and you can see these two structures opening and closing on either side like i said before they open up to let blood move from one chamber to another and then they close up so that the blood doesn't come back into the feeding chamber okay so four valves well in this view you can only see two this is the mitral valve and this is the tricuspid valve so, what is infective endocarditis? It's an infection of the, of the endocardium of the heart. So the heart has different layers. We have the pericardium, which is the outer layer. We have the myocardium, and then we have the endocardium. So the endocardium is the most innermost layer as well, which also includes the valve tissues. Okay. So it results when there's a bacterial or microbial infection. The okay. endocarditis usually begins when these germs enter into the bloodstream and then travel into the heart. It's, it's a very interesting thing because, like as you can see in this video, there's a constant movement of blood around the heart. It's very easy for microbes to continue to flow through and through, increasing the chances of infection. Okay. 
So bacterial infection is the most common cause of endocarditis um, because um, fungi can also be a cause of endocarditis. But today I will really focus on um, bacterial endocarditis. Streptococcus and Streptococcus species have collectively accounted for um, about 80% of all infected endocarditis cases. So this is another structure of the heart and this is a bacteria. This is the way a normal valve anatomy should be. You can just see very even. And this is an example of what happens when there is um, infective endocarditis. This is a formation of vegetation. I will show you more images as we go over. But you can see this, this is an abnormal feature of the valve. How can you get this? Um, it's very easy, even though it's not a very common disease or infection, it's very easy to get um, infective endocarditis. Dental procedures, this is one of the major ways of um, um, getting infective endocarditis. That's why a lot of dental procedures, following a lot of dental procedures, they give prophylaxis antibiotics, which is just preventive antibiotics, just to prevent um, any case of um, infective endocarditis from occurring. Poor dental hygiene as well can also lead to this. Implantable cardiac devices, some people need to have artificial part of the um, heart replaced or artificial um, structures put into their heart like a pacemaker. Some people need a pacemaker which helps the heart to be better. And the, of course, it's a foreign body, but that increases the chances of getting an infection. Surgery as well, um, infected wounds or needles. Another major group of people who are highly at risk of developing infective colitis are infected drug users um, because of the they have most of them do not use sterile sterile um, needles, so they are high risk of developing infective endocarditis. Pre-existing valvular heart disease also puts people at a higher risk of contracting this, and pre-existing heart conditions. Sometimes it's idiopathic, meaning that we cannot exactly trace how some people contract infective endocarditis. So this is just a a general example of the course of action which from where it starts from. So this is bacterial entry. It could be either through the mouth, the skin or IV lines uh, or through the GI tract. Okay. And as like I said, because the heart is a circulatory system, there's a constant flow of blood through the body, through the heart. So blood must always go through the heart. So blood, um, the red blood cells through the blood vessels can pick up um, bacteria from any part of the body and this goes back into the heart. Okay. Now this happens, and then you can see the bacteria, that's the one in green, and it continues to flow and then it accumulates, and eventually it leads to a vegetation, which is what you can see here, okay. Signs and symptoms. Uh, the signs and symptoms usually follow two approaches. One, you can have signs and symptoms as synonymous with a regular infection, so a high temperature, chills, night sweat, headache, um, shortness of breath with physical activity. And you, should, you could also have signs and symptoms that are suggestive of um, cardiovascular disease. Because this infection affects the structure of the heart, it could lead to um, cardiac failure or significant cardiac abnormality. And then people start to develop symptoms that are synonymous with um, heart failure or cardiac compromise. So you can have shortness of breath with um, physical activity, cough, tiredness, fatigue, muscle and joint pain. Some people also develop small red or purple dots on their skin, okay? And um, some people also develop something called autopnea, where they find it really difficult to lie, lie, lie down back. And this is usually in more advanced cases of infective endocarditis when there has been significant valve damage, okay? So the diagnosis, there are two major ways um, of effectively diagnosing effective endocarditis. And because it's quite tricky, um, it's of, some oftentimes missed in, in hospitals. So the first point of call is usually blood culture. So when someone presents in the clinic, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a imaging specialist, but I'll just cover this as well. So blood culture, when someone presents with typical infection um, signs and symptoms, you know, fever, sweat, everything, one of the first things people are supposed to do is to take a blood culture. The blood culture should be taken prior to commencement of, of antibiotics whenever possible. Um, working in the hospital in Nigeria, this was one of the major issues we had um, in terms of 
getting blood cultures back quickly. So oftentimes, most clinicians will start off with broad spectrum antibiotics before you know, they can get the blood cultures back. But you know, we always say you should start, you should always take blood cultures before you start antibiotics. If the treatment has already commenced, then blood culture should be taken as soon as possible. And then to ensure that we have a confirmed case, it's advised that three blood cultures must be collected before starting antibiotic therapy unless the patient is unstable. Okay. okay. Diagnosis imaging, which is my specialty. So once we had a positive culture, um, blood culture, or sometimes even before a positive blood culture, people are sent to do an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram is just like an ultrasound, an ultrasound of the heart, okay, where we get 2D or 3D images of the heart. This is an example. If you see, in, on echocardiogram, it shows up as a mobile mass. So it's a vegetation of accumulation of bacteria, um, blood cells, a lot of components, and it forms a mobile mass, which you can see here, moving about. So what happens is it starts, it starts to gradually damage the top of the valve and damage the valve so that the valve loses its normal structure and consequently loses its function. So this is another example of the mitral valve. This is how it should look. But if you look here, there's already formation of vegetation on this leaflet. So I'll show you. Remember, initially I told you there are four heart valves, and I'll just give you a typical example of, of um, endocarditis. This is a 19 year old woman, previously healthy with um, blood cultures, positive for Streptococcus viridens. You will see the um, echocardiogram image. I was taking. So, like I said, you can see the mobile mass moving across the valve. And this is another valve. This is the aortic valve. As you can see, the mobile mass as well on this valve. And one of the reasons why it is so dangerous for people to have this is because it damages the valve and can cause leakage of blood back into the chamber. So if you see this yellowish mosaic here, that is blood moving back into the heart. The blood should only move in one direction into the aorta and out of the body, out of the heart rather, but all the blood is moving back into this chamber. After a while, what happens is this chamber starts to dilate and becomes enlarged, and then it loses its function, and that patient goes into heart failure, and it's, it is fatal if not properly done. Uh, and this is another valve. And this is um, an injecting drug user. Can you, you, can you just look at this valve? How thick and it has been so damaged that it has stopped coopting, meaning that it has stopped. Closing. So here we can see it. there's going to be a free flow of blood back into that heart. If you can see, in this kind of cases, the only option is to replace the entire valve. Okay, so treatment of infective endocarditis um, can either be antibiotics or fungal treatment. And then what the qualitative organism is. For most, most bacteria based, so we use antibiotics. So the identity and the Susceptibility of the, of the mitral must be determined before antibiotics and hopefully be can also the circulation. You have to look at the patient holistically. Um, does the patient have any drug allergies? Is there any coexisting mobility? Um, existing yeah. So another option is surgery. And there are three major procedures that can be used to treat endocarditis. You can either repair the damaged valve, replace the entire valve with a prosthetic one, which could be a mechanical valve, or it could be a valve from a big valve, 
bovine valve. And we could also drain any abscess or repair any of the fistulas that may develop in the heart muscle. It's just like, you know, when you have a boil and there's pus. So sometimes that also happens inside the heart and then it has to be drained. Okay, treatment for infective endocarditis is the drug therapy. Um, for infective endocarditis caused by the streptococci, the treatment is usually because penicillin or curfiazone, and for enterococci, penicillin or amphetamine with pentamycin. Um, yes, yeah, so with this piece, this, these are just recommendations. It also depends on you know, your healthcare provider. And like Dr. Udumla said, the resistance of enterococci to multiple antibiotics, including vacuumazin, is becoming a major problem now. I'm just going to use the opportunity to give an example um, of a case that we had in clinic. So we had a gentleman in the late 60s present with the usual symptom, um, high temperature, fever. He had a murmur in the heart as well, and there were also some signs suggestive of infective endocarditis, and we did an echocardiogram and we saw masses in both aortic and uh, mitral valve. And because this had gone on for so long and he had been to several hospitals and was poorly managed in those hospitals, the situation had gone severe already. And at this stage, the only thing to do was surgery, including drug therapy, of course. But he was very unstable at the time, so we had to him stable, clinically stable, and in a space of two weeks, I think he coded about 10 times, That's he almost, he almost died about 10, 10 times, um, yeah, and we got into a clinically stable phase, and both valves were changed, and we're so happy, I remember that day he was discharged, we were so happy, because he had been in hospital for about two months, and he came on IV antibiotics after surgery, everything, protocol based on guidelines. And he was supposed to come back for full up two months after, and he presented in clinic, and my colleague and I were about to scan him. And immediately we put the probe on his chest. I'd never felt so sad for a patient in my entire career. We saw new vegetations had developed, even after changing the valve and using the, the recommended antibiotics. I'll come back to when I to, to explain when I when I'm done with the slide. Okay, so the next, like I said, surgery is usually recommended if the patient develops heart failure. Like I said with my patient, he had already developed heart failure. So the only option was to change the entire valve and the valve was damaged as well. If the patient has persistent fever despite treatment with antibiotics or antifungi, if the endocarditis is caused by a particular aggressive fungi or drug resistant bacteria, no other choice but to go in surgically. If the patient develops one or more blood clots despite being on treatment. So you can see those mobile masses. They have a high chance of dislodging and going to cause significant harm in other systems. So they could go and probably lodge in one of the blood vessels in the brain and cause a stroke and cause instant death. Okay. So um, patients who also have protective valves they have to replace the valve as well. And if there's obviously a pulse one abscess, it has to be surgically done. Um, I found a study actually very interesting, a study by Abubakar 2020 on, on antibiotic use among hospitalized patients in northern Nigeria. And they realized that metronidazole, ciprofloxacin, and um, amoxicillin, and gentamicin were the most commonly prescribed antibiotics. And I actually really believe this because I was just telling Dr. already the other day. Um, there's a clinic very close to my house in Nigeria, and we used to make a joke because every time you go to that hospital, if you go for headache, if you have a flu, you have stomach upset, if you have leg pain, if you have back pain, you would always come back with the same medication. And one day I just decided to look at the medication, like, is this a miracle drug or something that's supposed to cure everything? And I realized it was an antibiotic, and it was Ciprotac, so Ciprofloxacin. And and at that time, I didn't really know much about antibiotic resistance. Or, well, I mean, even at that time, I knew it was wrong. You know, there's no way one antibiotic can be used to treat several infections. Use UTI, stomach upset, every single thing you go there with, they will give you, they will give you that antibiotic standard in your, in your prescription. Okay, 
Oh, the study also revealed that the prevalence of antibiotic use was high. So out of every three prescriptions, one would have an antibiotic an antibiotic, which was a broad spectrum antibiotic, and there was also prolonged use of surgical antibiotic prophylaxis and redundant antibiotic combination. In conclusion, it showed that 20 to 50 percent of antibiotic prescription in the hospital was inappropriate, meaning where people were just giving antibiotics. And this also gives me um, points me to the fact that we know that not everyone is a healthcare professional. I know you put your life in the hand of your doctors and you should and you should trust them. But it's also important to also get the knowledge about antibiotic resistance and equip yourself, not just even about antibiotics, in any aspect of healthcare as well. You know, always ask questions if you're not clear about anything. Ask your doctor, why are you giving me this tablet? The one thing I've noticed that they don't do in hospitals in Nigeria, they don't show you tablets or give you Tell, tell you to do certain tests and you don't even understand what you're doing or why you're doing them. I think it's, it should start becoming common practice for us to be interested in the kind of medications that we're giving, ask why we're giving them. Even if you have to go and go, well, I don't really encourage too much Googling, but if you need to ask, you know, for why, why do you constantly give me this antibiotic? Why, why are you not giving me something else? You know, ask questions, ask your pharmacist, ask your doctor. I'll ask this question, how do you think this would affect the effective treatment of infective endocarditis in a situation whereby you are constantly given the same antibiotics over and over and, and over again, and the patient comes down with infective endocarditis sensitive to that particular antibiotic treatment? Is there anyone who wants to say anything? What do you think would happen if someone comes down with infective endocarditis susceptible to Say penicillin, and he has been taking penicillin for stomach pain, headache, fever, and everything. What do you think would happen if he's given that treatment? It might not work. Okay, yes, it might not work. And when it doesn't work, what happens? So I'm going to go back to that story I, I told earlier. A patient died two months after. It was we had exhausted all our options. We had, we had done drug therapy, he had undergone surgery, and he was too unstable to go back in again for another open heart surgery. And we kept giving him antibiotics for two, two months after he, he died. So I don't, I'm not privy, I don't really have his medical history to know if that misused any antibiotics or in the past, but it's, it just gives us food for thought to see that. Like Dr. Uzumba said, we need to be more mindful about the way we take antibiotics. Okay, so I'll just talk a summary and our role. Um, antibiotics are useful definitely in minimizing the risk of endocarditis or any other infection, really. But in order to protect our health, our pharmacists, our doctors, or licensed health we not always recommend them because there are sometimes we actually push or oh, give me antibiotics. Yeah, personally, I had I had a surgery earlier this year and I was discharged without any antibiotics. And I felt a bit weird because I felt in Nigeria, once you have surgery, they give you antibiotics. And I was asking my doctor, won't you give me any antibiotics? I said, why do you need antibiotics? And I said, I feel like I just need antibiotics just to prevent any infection. Okay. But our doctors or healthcare professionals may not always recommend them because they may not be needed. Like in my case, um, it might be dangerous to your health. Some people are allergic to certain antibiotics. Um, taking them in excess will promote the development of stronger antibiotic resistant bacteria. What's the take home message really? Um, do not take antibiotics. You are not prescribed by a qualified healthcare professional. You know, and you need to get tested before you are given antibiotics. So yes, so you need to ensure, ask questions. If you just give them, you ask, why aren't you going to test before you give me an antibiotic? Be interested in your care. Don't just take anything given to you. Don't just take any medication given to you. Okay? And why? Just like we've been saying, effective treatment of life-threatening infections, such as endocarditis, relies on the optimal antibiotic drug therapy. And if we continue to misuse antibiotics, will pose a tremendously dangerous problem. So, yes, that's, that's the end of my talk. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. ask them. 
Thank you so much, Juliet. That was a great presentation. Um, okay, so let's see. We do have some questions in the chat. Let's go to the first one. So the first question is for you, Juliet. Can the bacteria detach from the valves and travel somewhere else in the body? Yes, it can. So it can dislodge and and um, go to brain, any blood vessel, and cause significant other issues like a stroke. So it can we call it embolize. So it can embolize and and, and go somewhere else. So what is embolize? Please explain. Embolize is just um, the, the dislodgement of you know, it's a mobile mass, like I showed in the video. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it, it moves. And because the heart and the valves are constantly in motion, it's not like it's just sitting pretty on an it's, it's constant movement. Mm -hmm. of the and the, so it's easy for, for it to dislodge because of that constant movement. So that embolization just means it has dislodged, it has mm -hmm. traveled through the blood vessel. I'm going, to, I'm going to lodge somewhere. So let's say this is the blood vessel. Or a blood vessel and just keeps traveling and decides to stop here. Let's say this is the brain. To prevent the normal flow of blood going through the blood vessel and causing a stroke. Alrighty. So can it travel to the lungs, you know, to the legs? Yes. That's why it's so dangerous because mm -hmm. the heart is at the center, we call it the circulatory system. Mm -hmm. So the heart is like a transport system. Okay? Blood comes from your head, from your leg, every part of your body comes to the right side of your heart. Okay? From the right side of your heart, it goes to the lungs, pick up oxygen. The blood that comes to the right side of your heart has no oxygen at all. It's called Dead blood. Okay. Now we go there, okay, and then it comes back to the left side of the heart, and then it's pushed out to the other part of your body. Then it goes mm -hmm. to deposit oxygen, and then comes back empty again. But you see, there's so much movement in and around the heart, so it's so easy for it to dislodge. So, for example, injecting drug users, they usually have endocarditis in the right side of the heart. Okay. Okay, because that's that's the one that goes into the heart. So they inject in the hand and it goes to the right side. So for example, if a patient has an, a mobile mass on the tricuspid valve, for example, and that blood is going to the lungs. Okay. So that's that's just one one highway express. Yeah. Basically, if it dislodges. All righty, thank you for that. Uh, another question after treatment, is is it you know endocarditis cured? Can it be cured? Yeah, it also depends. So the prognosis, which is the, the life course of the disease, the term, it depends on several factors. So how extensive is it? So some people have positive blood cultures, mm -hmm. but when you look at their hearts with echocardiogram, there's no physical vegetation. Okay, so when they take the blood, it's possible for, for the infection. When you look at the heart, hasn't had time to grow and vegetate. there's no valvular destruction. In that case, usually it's blood therapy and monitoring after some months, and then some people are clear. I have scanned quite a few people who have, you know, who have been killed. Some people are left with some form of valvular damage even after their blood cultures come back negative. So with infective endocarditis, there are two ways. So it's you tackle the blood and then you tackle the heart, really. So it depends on how how extensive the damage is. So if, I mean, if no, I was just going to say. So, like, how long would it take for a valve to be damaged? Is it different depending on the organism, or yes, uh, well, I'm gonna say yeah. I'm gonna say depending on the organism. Sometimes um, people, especially Nigerians, if you notice, they start having fever or temperature, they self medicate, they stay at home for one month, present to the hospital maybe two months after, when they can't breathe, is giving that bacteria two months to grow and damage your valves. Yeah, so it, it takes a while. It's, it's, not just, it's not as acute as a day or a week. Yes. Right, okay. It takes a while. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the, of course, get prompt care at, at, yeah. at the hospital with the health, qualified healthcare professional. Don't treat yourself like we've been saying. That's yeah. the message we've been sharing since we started. Um, don't... Um, self-treat go and see a qualified healthcare professional 
Yeah. Um, okay. And push for testing. Push for yeah. testing, which is something I don't think we do enough. Enough yeah. of, yes. Uh, perhaps, like, perhaps the pushing comes because, for example, in Nigeria, they have to pay for the test. But sure. it's always better to pay for the test so that you can get the right treatment for whatever organism is the long run. So it's always better to push for testing, yes. Yeah. Okay, so the other question is, what kind of materials are used to replace the faulty valves? So we have mechanical um, valves. There are some of them that are made of different materials. And we have bioprosthetic. So the bioprosthetic ones are ones made from tissue. So sometimes they take one of your valve tissue. So we know we have four valves. So for example, the aortic valve needs to be changed. Okay. You can take the pulmonic valve and put it into the aortic valve because the aortic valve does a lot of, I think it does the most work really because that's the one that opens up to push the blood out of the heart. And then they replace the pulmonic valve, which is a smaller valve and less has less work to do. You just put something else there and then put the tissue out there. So it could either be made of, um, I would say some form of metal, that is the mechanical yeah. valve. Because some people if you go close to them, you can actually hear the valve ticking. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, the older valves are like that. You can hear, you can hear okay. the sound. But newer valves um, are, you can also use pig, um, pig valve. We call that bovine. Sometimes they use pig valve, they use a human valve, and then they can use a mechanical valve as well. So they look at the patient, they look at the age, they look at the cause, why do they need to change the valve? Um, so it depends on the on the patient really. If you're on a mechanical valve, there's some valves you have that you have to take blood tests for the rest of your life. Yes, yeah. and some valves you don't need to take blood tests, but they don't last as long. So someone who is say 75 who needs a valve replacement, they'll probably just give you the one that lasts 15 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you're a younger patient, they might give you something that lasts longer. Where you don't need to take blood thinners for too long because blood thinners also have contraindication. You have to be careful the risk of bleeding out. Out there, so it, it it depends on the patient. The healthcare professional would decide. Um, they ask the patient sometimes as well, which would you prefer? You want a mechanical? Yeah. Some people don't want to take a big valve, for example, probably for religious or personal reasons, they might not want that. Okay. Great, very fascinating this. Thank you. Um, Nabavinia, Mabube, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Mabube, Nabavinia, if you're unable to unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate for nice presentation. It's very informative. I have just uh, one general question as you are experts in antibacterial material. I want to wonder, is it possible that we are using such new biomolecules or microRNA to, to make a rapid test uh, for find the bacteria infections and or use that once uh, for new antibacterial drug development? I think that this is directed to you, I think, Dr. Zumba. Did you get the question? Sorry, could you come again, please? Oh, sorry. So what's, what, what uh, Mabuba is saying, what's your idea about the role of biomolecules or microRNA for rapid bacteria infection tests and developing new antibacterial drugs? Um, okay, so... Off the top of my head, um, I assume you're referring to like maybe like quick assays. So, for example, if you wanted to, because I think typically, like if you had to do like blood cultures, something that um, um, this is Juliet by the most I'm talked about, like maybe for endocarditis, like you have to wait for the bacteria to grow, right? And that takes like some time, and then wait for the bacteria to grow. Then you then go to do the test. So I think they're like, um, I think research is ongoing to figure out like like quicker ways that we can use to like detect the kind of bacteria that are present in samples, maybe like in blood samples or urine samples or like um, um, saliva samples, for example. 
And for so, so for those kinds of tests, um, what one way to probably approach like the design could be like maybe using like specific proteins that are unique to that uh, bacteria, or using like maybe like specific um, other biomolecules, maybe like the DNA or the RNA, such that you can design maybe like a let's say like a chemical compound, right? You design the compound, and then like um, so for uh, just practical let's say you design a compound you design it in such a way that it is very specific because we don't want like maybe like for something like what you call like false results something is there but it's not there so you can design a an assay or a test that is very specific such that whenever let's say for example whenever it sees that particular bacteria's protein or that particular bacteria let's say dna then let's say maybe like it can change color let's say like the saliva was colorless right but when you put that chemical inside, once it sees it, like you can design it in such a way that the saliva will then change blue or it will change purple. So those sort of like rapid tests. So that way you can say, oh, this bacteria is here. So let's try and use that, um, that this particular antibiotic. So that way, like it shortens the time. Because I uh, like, for example, I guess like one of the reasons why, which we can't help right, well, sort of can't help right now. I think one of the reasons why you have like um, antibiotic resistance could be like, like I think Juliet mentioned, like sometimes like, you know, um, um, healthcare practi practitioners can put like patients on, a pa um, patients on a particular, let's say like they suspect that, oh, this person might have, let's say endocarditis or something, but they haven't done the blood culture. So they put them on one antibacteria, um, antibiotic medication, right? Um, um, and then they are waiting for the result. Then if the result now comes and they're like, oh, it's not even this bacteria that they were suspecting, then they have to shift to another antibiotic, right? But that person has already been exposed to that antibiotic. So if we have like this sort of rapid test, it will reduce the risk of like um, healthcare partners giving like just brought, um, antibiotics before they actually have the, um, the final results from like the blood culture. So definitely like getting like this sort of biomolecules like proteins or DNA that we can use to develop like rapid tests would be very helpful in reducing. I, I think that's one of the ways to actually contribute to like um, reducing the risk for antimicrobial resistance because we can then know the kind of bacteria that's causing infection quickly and we get the right antibiotic for that instead of like just sort of like doing like guesswork until we get the results from 